to God be the glory. Since my accident, the book of Job has become of particular significance to me, especially with reference to his suffering. The book of Job has been heralded as one of the greatest masterpieces of literature ever to exist. Professor Richard G. Moulton suggested that a majority of literary people would pronounce the book of Job as the greatest poem in the world's literature. Victor Hugo once said, Tomorrow, if all literature was to be destroyed and it was left to me to retain only one work, he said, I should save Job. Daniel Webster wrote, taken as a mere work of literary genius, he said it's one of the most wonderful productions of any age or any language. Now, as to when the book was written, the date of the book of Job, many scholars believe that it is one of the earliest books of the Bible. Of course, the date is not given, but when you read the book, it's clear that it is before the law of Moses. It is during the patriarchal period. For example, we we see that Job is functioning as a priest, that he's offering sacrifices for his family. Job's extremely long life is characteristic of people who lived before the flood. But there's a statement that's interesting to me in this regard. In Job 22 and verse 16, it says, Will you keep to the old way which wicked men have trod, who were cut down before their time, now listen to this, whose foundations were swept away by a flood. That seems to be a reference to the flood of Noah's day and is maybe a time reference. It it seems to be that uh, whatever it is, this is very early in man's history. Now, the purpose of the book of Job, I would say, is the same as any other Old Testament book, and that is to bring us to Christ. Job 19 verse 25, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at the last day on the earth. But friends, along the way in the book of Job, there are many wonderful lessons for us. The book extols the glory of God. It teaches us some things about the devil that we don't learn anywhere else. It provides us some great proofs in the realm of science and apologetics. And there's some fabulous material there about dinosaurs and various other animals. And of course, Job deals with the problem of human suffering. What we're going to do in the study today is we're going to briefly go through the book of Job, particularly the first two chapters, and we're going to pull out some lessons along the way. All right, here's number one. Lesson number one is that a man can be perfect. A man can be perfect. Now, you may say, what are you talking about? Listen to the very first verse in this book, Job 1 and verse 1. The Bible says, the New King James, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Now, the word that's translated as blameless here in the New King James is actually translated as perfect in the Old King James. It says he was perfect. Now, you might be a little bit stunned to hear that Job is described as perfect, and you might be thinking to yourself, I didn't think that anyone was perfect except the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Of course, you'd be right about that. But the word here that's translated as perfect is a word that means complete. It means blameless. It means without moral blemish. It doesn't mean that Job never sinned. In fact, in Job 14 and verse 16, Job specifically references the fact that he had sinned. And so what's the point? What is the significance of the statement that he was perfect, that he was blameless? Friends, it means this. Job lived like he was supposed to live. Now, why am I bringing out this point? Friends, sometimes people have the idea that we just can't live right. We can never be right in the eyes of God. We mess up all the time. We sin constantly. We're perpetual sinners. Friends, that is very discouraging thinking. In fact, if you're a Christian, that is absolutely incorrect thinking. And so I am encouraged to read about a man that though he sinned, he is viewed by God as blameless and perfect. It tells me that I can live in such a way that God will look at me and be pleased. 
Now, here's the question. How did Job acquire such a reputation with God? Well, in verse 1, the word upright appears. It means that he was straight. That's what the word means, that, that he lived straight. It means he did not deviate from the paths of righteousness. He did his utmost to do things that are right. And when you read the book, you read some of these things. You read about his worship about his kindness, about him helping the poor and the widows. Verse number one also says that he feared God. And so he lived straight. He feared God. This has to do with his reverence, his respect, his attitude. You know, I think we see this sort of thing today when it comes to our demeanor toward worship. How do we feel? How do we act? Even how do we dress when we come to reverence God? Notice also, verse number one says that he shunned evil. And so he lived straight. He had a proper demeanor toward God. He shunned evil. The ESV says he turned away from evil. What that means is anything that God would disapprove of, Job rejected it. Now, you also see in chapter one that Job's a family man. He's constantly offering sacrifices for his children. He's A family man, he's concerned about their spirituality. You see that in verse 5. In verse number 20, he's worshiping. In verse 21, he's blessing the name of God. Now, what's the lesson in all of this? It's this. I can live righteously. I can live in such a way that I can know that I'm pleasing to God, and I can know that I'm going to go to heaven. I can keep myself unspotted from this world. Friends, that is encouraging to me. God has not given me a task that I cannot accomplish. All right, here's a second thing I want us to glean from a study of Job. When you look at Job, you learn some things that are going on in the spiritual realm. That's going to be our second point, some things going on in the spiritual realm. Now, you may say, what in the world are you talking about? In the New Testament, there are some statements such as these. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Think about that for a minute. The devil is prowling, he's looking, he's seeking. Revelation 12 and verse 9, the devil is called one who deceives the world. He's referred to in the next verse as the accuser of our brethren. Hold that thought. Listen to this one. Ephesians 6 and verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now listen to verse 12. This gets really deep into the spiritual realm. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now let's put all of this together. Friends, these verses tell me that the devil is after us. He's seeking our souls. He's an accuser. He's a deceiver. But then I learn that all of this is going on in the spiritual realm, in a place that that I can't see as of yet. What exactly is he talking about? What's taking place? How does this work? Well, James chapter 1 and verse 14 teaches us that one of the ways that the devil works against me is he uses my own lust against me. 2 Corinthians 11, I learn another way. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15 teaches me that he works through other people. Sometimes human beings become ministers of the devil. But you see, the book of Job gives us some insight into some things that you just can't find anywhere else in the Bible. So I want to begin looking at this together. Job chapter 1 and verse 6, the Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, the sons of God here is talking about angels, and we learn that even angels are required to give an account of their activities to God. We also learn that Satan, incidentally, the word Satan here means adversary. Satan also is there presenting himself before God. I don't know. I don't know how Satan is able to enter into the presence of God, so don't ask me. Every time I speak about this, someone always says, how was Satan allowed to do this? I don't know. Somehow God allows this. And then a conversation takes place. Verse number 7, And the Lord said to Satan, 
from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Verse 8, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Verse 9, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to the face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. The Bible says, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, the conversation here, friends, is fascinating. God points out to the devil this man, Job. He says, have you considered this man in his outstanding characteristics? The devil's response is, he says, God, he only serves you because you bless him. In other words, he says he only does right for what he can get out of it. And keep in mind, Job is rich. In fact, verse 3 says, he's the richest man in the East. He's got a good family, a large family, but the devil says the only reason he serves you is because of that. It's not because you're worthy of it. It's not because you deserve praise. Rather, it's for what he can get out of it. Remember what we read a minute ago, Revelation 12, 9 and 10? The devil is an accuser of our brethren. Anyway, the devil says to God, if you take away his blessings, he will curse you to the face. He will turn from you. And God responds to the devil, to Satan. He says, behold, all that he has is in your power, but don't lay a hand on his person. In other words, don't physically, personally touch him. Now, I want you to keep in mind here, Job has absolutely no idea about this conversation. Job's just going on about normal life, normal business. He's going to work, spending time with his family. He's worshiping, serving God. He's offering sacrifices. As far as Job is concerned, this is a day just like any other day. In fact, do you think Job might have responded differently if he had been privy to this conversation? I don't know. Friends, this is great insight into the spiritual realm. You see, I know that the devil is walking about and seeking me. I know that he is a tempter. I know that he's a deceiver. I know that he's an accuser. I know that he's trying to attack me. And I see these things going on in the spiritual realm. Now I want you to listen again to Ephesians 6 and verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual host of wickedness. Therefore, in light of what he said, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. All right, here's number three. This is the third lesson I want us to draw from the book of Job. And it is the fact that, friends, the devil is relentless. In Job chapter one, the end of verse 12, the Bible says, so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now listen to verse 13. Now, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. So Job's children are all together, and they're, they're eating together. They're having some sort of uh, a meal. And everyone is oblivious, of course, to this conversation that's taking place between God and Satan. As far as they know, it's just a normal day. Job's children are gathered together, and they're at the house of the oldest brother. Job is somewhere else. A servant comes into Job... And he says, Master Job, he says, there's been a raid. And the Sabaeans stole your oxen and your donkeys, and they killed all of your servants, all of those who were there except for me. Now, I want you to keep in mind, Job's flock is huge. And so this accounts for a huge financial loss that's really going to set him back. And then, before he can even catch his breath, another servant comes in, verse number 16, and he says, Job, fire has fallen from heaven and burned up the sheep and killed the servants there, he says, except for me. Most commentators think that the fire from heaven here is probably a reference to lightning. Again, huge financial loss. 
Now, before that servant could even finish telling what happened, another servant runs in, and he said, Job, the Chaldeans, they've come, and they've stolen the camels, and they've killed all the servants who were there. And Now, I'm going to stop for a minute. I want you to get a grasp on this, because in a matter of minutes, Job goes from one of the richest men in the East to being financially bankrupt. And then, before it's finished, another servant runs in, and he tells him that a tornado struck the house where all of his sons and his daughters were together eating, and he says they're all dead. What do you do? In a matter of minutes, he goes from a wealthy man with 10 children to a poor man facing 10 funerals. What do you do? Verse 20 says, Then Job arose, and he tore his robe, and he shaved his head. These are signs of grief. And he fell to the ground, and he worshiped. Verse 21, he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And verse 22 says, In all of this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Friends, this is amazing. How many people would have cursed God? How many people would have turned their back on the Lord forever? You know, since I had this accident in which I have uh, become a paraplegic, I have had interaction with a great number of other spinal cord injury patients, most of whom, like me, have lost the ability to walk. Many of them, a great number of them, are very bitter. A lot of them blame God. That's what a lot of people do when they experience these type things. But even in this, Job finds occasion, the Bible says, he blesses the Lord. He says, blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't sin, he blessed God. But you see, Satan is relentless. And so, once again, the angels come before God, and Satan's with them, and Satan says to the Lord, sure, he passed that test. But I tell you what, you let me touch him personally, and he will curse you. God says in verse 6, Behold, he is in thine hand, he says, but save his life. That is, you can touch him physically, but don't kill him. I take that to mean anything short of death. Verse number 7, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and he struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took for himself a pot sherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Now, uh, I want you to remember again, Job doesn't know what's going on. All Job knows is that he's had these financial disasters. He's lost his children. Then all of a sudden, he's broken out in boils. Scholars have argued about exactly what this condition might be. Two of the most common explanations are leprosy or elephantitis, and whatever it is, it was characterized by boils, chapter 2 and verse 7, itching, chapter 2 and verse 8, a drastic change in his appearance, chapter 2 and verse 12, difficulty eating, 324, mental depression, 325, worms and running sores, chapter 7 and verse 5, shortness of breath, 918, darkness of the eyes, 1616, odorous breath, 1917, a loss of weight, chapter 19 and verse 20, gnawing pain, chapter 30 and verse 17, blackened skin and fever, chapter 30 and verse 30. In chapter 2 and verse 8, Job has a broken piece of pottery, and he's just scraping himself. You can imagine the, the pus oozing from the sores and the dirt and the ash sticking to his body. You know, I expect that Job probably would have had one of his children who was particularly comforting, one who was a nurturer, and in a moment of suffering that maybe she would come to her dad, but she's not there because his children have died. But then, Job's wife enters the picture. You know, maybe he can at least get some comfort from her. You know, we all know that in our lowest moments, the words of encouragement that come from friends and family and those that we love can make all the difference in the world. And so here she comes. Chapter 2 and verse 9, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Job's wife suggested that he curse God and die. Friends, how must his heart have just sunk within him when he heard that? 
Verse 10, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. You know, we oftentimes talk about the patience of Job. I think we can learn a lesson here from Job about the ability to hold your tongue. And just when you think things can't get any worse, three of Job's friends come to visit. Their names were Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. Bildad, Zophar, Eliphaz. Verse 11 says that they came to, quote, comfort him, but they did everything except that. Verse 12 says, and when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, so they're approaching, they, they, they don't even recognize Job, probably because his condition had altered his appearance so much. The Bible says they lifted their voices and wept, and each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. I have a note that I wrote in my Bible years ago next to verse 13 where it says, no one spoke a word to him. I wrote, this is the best comfort they gave him. The reason I said that is because in chapter 3 and verse 1, you start to see Job's attitude, and then following that, you're going to see what they did say to him. In chapter 3 and verse 1, Job opens his mouth. The Bible says he curses his day. That means his birthday. What he's saying quite literally is, I wish I'd never been born. Then in verse 11, he says, why couldn't I have died as soon as I came out of the womb? And then here it comes. Job's friends finally say something, but it's not good. What they say, are you ready for this? This is what they say. Job's friends in essence say, and I'm summarizing this, but they said, Job, we never knew you were so evil. If God is punishing you like this, you apparently are a very wicked man. Friends, Satan is relentless. He wants your soul. What we have in these two chapters are some of the ways that the devil will attack us. I want you to notice some of the devices in Satan's arsenal. He will use your income, your money against you. He'll use your family and your children, your health, your spouse, your friends. He will use any and all of these things he can to get you. Here's lesson number four, point number four. Because of Job's relationship with God, his trials actually end up making him better. You know the old saying, your trials can make you better or they can make you bitter? And really what it comes down to is your mindset. I want you to consider about four things with me. Number one is this, trials perfect faith and build character. Let me say that again. I want you to think about it. Trials perfect faith, and they build character. Job himself says this, chapter 23 and verse 10, he says, when he tried me, I shall come forth as gold. That is, I'm going to be better. At the end of Job's trial, he says this, I have heard of thee by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees you. That is, Job said, I, I've known of God, I've heard of God, but, but now I see him. Surely Job had seen God before, but now as never before. His trials had perfected him. They had perfected his character. I want to read you an article from an old church bulletin from J.R. Barnett. It's dated June of 1974. It says, a young man had invested all of his savings in a peach orchard. He worked hard, the weather was favorable, he had a beautiful crop. Then, just before harvest, a blasting hailstorm struck. In a matter of minutes, everything he worked for was ruined. Embittered by the experience, he quit going to church. A Christian friend expressed his concern. The young man said, I'm not going to church anymore because I can't love, I can't worship a God who cares so little about me that he would let hell destroy my crop. All was silent for a while. Then the friend said, the Lord loves you more than the crop. He knows that the fruit does better without the storm, but he knows it is impossible to produce Christian character 
without the storms of life. You see, God's primary concern is to develop strong men, he said, not lovely peaches. You know, many people equate God's providence with events that are favorable, such as being spared from a near tragedy, but their confidence in the Lord gets shaken when a disaster strikes. But this article goes on to say this, providence has two edges. One edge brings protection from painful things. The other edge permits painful things in order to build strong people. Here's the second consideration I want you to ponder with me. It is that trials produce patience. Trials produce patience. Endurance is really what we're talking about. In James chapter 1 and verse 2, James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, endurance. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing. What does that mean? As we're tried, as we're tested, we're strengthened, we're made better. Romans chapter 5 and verse 3 says, we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Friends, the point is, trials strengthen us. They give us endurance. We're stronger because of them. Number three, Trials promote trust in the Lord. You know, there is a strange tendency in mankind, when things are going well, to trust in myself. But when trials come, it oftentimes results in people turning and trusting God. Job said, Job 13 and verse 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. The little girl on the airplane was amazingly calm, in spite of a severe turbulence. Somebody asked her, how can you be so calm when, when this is going on on the plane? The little girl said, my daddy is the pilot. Friends, that's the attitude that we ought to have. When we face the storms of life, as we're carried through the turbulence, we need to remember, if we're Christians, my father is the pilot. And when we can adopt that type of thinking, it will produce in us an amazing calm. What am I worried about? It's not like my father doesn't own the world. You know, we're living in strange times in this world. If you turn on the news, there are strange, odd, tumultuous things going on all around us. But if we're Christians, we need to remember God is in control. The Lord's on his throne, and I should be strengthened and encouraged. Here's the fourth thing. I want you to appreciate with me that trials paralyze the devil. The accusation that Satan makes is that every man has his price. But you see, when men endure the trials faithfully, the devil is silenced. After Satan has killed Job's children and taken away his riches, and Job is suffering with boils all over his body, in chapter 3 and verse 25, Job makes the following statement. He says, For the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me and what I dreaded has happened to me. In other words, what he's saying is, the thing that I dreaded most in life, the thing that I've been afraid of, he said, I'm living it. But when you get to the end of the book of Job, chapter 42 and verse 12 says this, Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. I want to conclude with one more verse. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. The Bible says, and I want you to keep in mind, this is for Christians, for our light affliction, which is for but a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Ponder that our light affliction. It's not that heavy. He says it is for but a moment. It's not that long. He said, but what we have ahead of us is an eternal weight of glory.